it's Shaba. Welcome back to another Tuesday, another week, another video. How you doing? If you follow me on any other social media platform, actually even on here, I have posted about the fact that I passed my Viber this week for my PhD. Over the years, you've asked me so many questions about my PhD, I've not been able to answer them. But now that I've passed my Viber, I can. And I will let you know all about what I've been up to for the past three years. But first, I wanna give a little shout out to the Self Love Club. Memberships is a new feature that I'm using here on the Sharba channel. And there should be a little join button down there where you can see a little video that tells you more about what being a member of the Self Love Club is. You get tons of extra perks like behind the scenes updates, secret little messages but the thing I'm most excited about is our very first secret live stream for members only which will be taking place on Tuesday the 30th of November so if you're thinking of being a member no pressure but if you would like to maybe consider doing it before then so we can all do that together it's gonna be a lot of fun but until then let's talk about my PhD what what, what the hell have you been doing Sharba for the past three years I've created a list of FAQs from your questions if there's anything extra pop it downstairs in the comments section we'll have a chat down there so firstly what is a PhD a PhD is a doctorate in philosophy technically and everyone's like oh I can't believe you did something in philosophy. No, all, all PhDs are doctorates in philosophy, but it's not my subject. My actual subject choices were psychology and computer science. And a PhD is a research doctoral program, so you don't have lectures or anything, but you work with supervisors, so experts already in a similar field to what you're doing. You provide a novel contribution to the research field. So something new that you can do to be like, hey, yeah, I'm a researcher now. And once you've done that, you can go on and have an academic career as a lecturer, as a researcher at universities, you get to call yourself a doctor. My specific contribution, novel contribution to the field, was about a concept called parasocial relationships. A buzz term that I'm sure everyone's talking about. It seems to be very trendy uh, this past year. But three years ago when I discovered it, I really wanted to look at them because I've been a creator here, as has Jamie, as have a lot of my friends. I was just really fascinated by this bond. I didn't understand how these relationships could exist that are one-sided, but they can really impact someone's life. So that's what I wanted to look into, the impact on mental health and well-being and behavior specifically. Basically, and being very crude, this is not like research technical lingo. I wanted to see if YouTubers helped make the world a better place. <laughs> I wouldn't be poppy, frilly, naive Shaba if I didn't try. And that is what I did. That is what my research is about. Parasocial relationships is a psychological term used to describe one-sided relationships between a mass group of viewers, so lots of people who look specifically towards one performer. So if you think about like your favorite book character, your favorite TV show, like, oh my gosh, I have like the biggest parasocial relationship of PSR with uh, David Rose from Schitt's Creek, my goodness. And of course people have PSRs with their favorite creators. And seeing as I had a great reason resource of creators and a great resource and a huge pool of viewers to grab participants from. That is what my PhD focused on. How long did it take me to do a PhD? Three years, give or take a few months. You come up with like a structure of a project which includes multiple studies. For me, I did seven studies in my PhD. Some people say that's very ambitious. Other people say it's not enough. Like it's, it, it just seems to vary a lot depending where you go. I know someone who did 14 studies and I thought that was wild. But I also know other people like Jamie, for example, who did three. So, you know, it's different. You work through your research projects, you compile this huge document of your findings called the thesis, and at the end you have something called the viva voce, which sounds way cooler than it is. It's a it's viva, it's an oral exam where you defend your work to experts in the field. The exam itself lasts about three hours, it did for me, and I'm not gonna lie, it was a nasty experience. <laughs> I personally didn't enjoy it, but apparently that's quite unusual as well. Like loads of people are like, oh, enjoy it. It's the only time that people want to talk to you about your research and you can have a really fun discussion about what it's gonna be. I don't know if that's because some of my examiners were uh, new to the process and also from the US, where I understand a defense is different. It didn't feel all happy and yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it was stressful. But you know what? I survived it. I did it. I'm done. <laughs> I'm glad to have that part behind. So how much does a PhD cost? That's another question I've been getting. In the UK, typically a PhD has a yearly fee. I just checked today and at the University of Essex, which is where I went to, the fee was £5,360 a year. And you pay that three times, so over three years, unless you're an international student. In that case, the fee ranges depending on subject and is between 16 and 19,000 pounds 
a year. That is not fair. Many students have signed many petitions for I just think it's, I don't think it's very fair at all. But right now, as it stands, that is unfortunately how much it costs. Many people who do PhDs don't do it if they can't get funding. So funding in the sense of like a scholarship that can waive their fees. And sometimes you can find scholarships that don't only waive your fee, but also provide you with like a living stipend. So you also don't have to work to, you know, like, afford a house over your head and food on your plate. But yeah, it's quite unheard of, at least through the people that I've met, um, to self-fund a PhD. Most people who do it, do it because they've been able to get funding. If you don't get funding, you don't do PhD. It's not a hard and fast rule. Like obviously do PhD if you can afford to do it, that's amazing. Um, but I just think it's because most people can't afford to do it that that's why we end up having people who are only funded. I did apply for many scholarships. I got rejected for many scholarships. I did receive funding. Another question that I've been receiving, is that it? Is it all done? Can I read it? Where can I find it? You're adorable. I love your enthusiasm. It's very sweet. Yes, you will be able to read it. No, it's not quite done. You would think I submitted my thesis, big celebration. I had my Viva, big celebration. Celebration. You'd think it'll all be done. There is one tiny step that is left to do. I have a few corrections that have come out of my Viva that I need to fix and add to my project that my examiners have recommended. Then it will be publicly available on the University of Essex repository. You can then find it on like Google Scholar and all of that stuff. Um, and I've got some papers coming out too. So yes, it will be available on the internet by next calendar year because my supervisors and I are determined to get this done before Christmas. <laughs> so what is your PhD about? Uh, apart from parasocial relationships, which I know I've like mentioned a few times over the Side Guys podcast and in a few Q and A's, um, I can actually tell you properly now. Firstly though, I do have to say a huge thank you to the amazing creators who helped me out with this and also to you, amazing, amazing viewers, especially if you actually participated by clicking on the little survey links and undertaking some of that research for me. I truly appreciate it. Research wouldn't be research if we didn't get the views of many, many people. And to explain what I did specifically, but in like basic terms that I hope everyone can understand. We first try to understand how parasocial relationships sort of fit within our wider social networks. So we have close ties, which are really close friends, spouses, real close people in our lives, right? And when we think of relationships, that's who we typically think of. Like these are the people that help us in our lives. And they're also weak ties. So the people that we sort of take for granted and don't see as much, neighbors, colleagues, people that we don't speak to very much, but who's still in our lives. And guess what? They're still super important. We wanted to understand whether parasocial relationships were thought of in people's minds in the same way. And we found out that, yeah, in terms of how effective they're perceived by people to be at fulfilling needs, parasocial relationships were actually considered more effective than weak ties, but not as effective as strong ties, except for in one, savoring happiness. We kind of went into a world pandemic as I entered my second year. And so it kind of threw my research plans off schedule, but we used that as a real cool opportunity. I think it's a cool opportunity to understand how parasocial relationships influence people. And basically a parasocial relationship with someone made people looking at happy things feel even happier but also made people looking at sad things feel even sadder. So they were like an amplifier, right? Like, like a big foghorn for the effects of what media does to us, which I thought was really interesting. Also, parasocial relationships encourage people to be more pro-social, which again, I think is amazing. So in terms of being compliant with the pandemic's rules, in terms of just going above and beyond with being kind, and in terms of like donating financially and helping businesses out, the stronger the parasocial relationship was, the more pro-social people seemed to be. So I thought that was pretty cool too. We also looked into how parasocial relationships are created in the first place. And one thing that's fundamental for creating a feeling of closeness and a relationship is disclosure. So actually talking about your experiences and yourself. And research shows that disclosure is actually so much more important for generating that sense of closeness more than how similar you are to someone and even more to how much time you spend with someone. But we found that disclosure was also really important and works in a one way way. <laughs> where just one person is disclosing as they would like on a computer screen, right? Where you can't actually disclose back to me watching this video right now. And finally, and most excitingly to me, the thing that I wanted to test from the very beginning was are these parasocial relationships that we have with creators making a difference in the world? Can they be used for social good? And so we looked at it in terms of prejudice. And we actually found very excitingly that one person sharing their experience of being different, of being marginalized, specifically in the realm of mental health, decreased people's explicit prejudice towards mental health and also intergroup anxiety. So the, the anxiety that people face when speaking with people who are not part of the same group as them, which I think is friggin' amazing. And we also found that that doesn't have to be from a long relationship for that effect to take place. It worked even after just one exposure. I'm very proud of this result. I'm very 
glad to have found this. So there you go. That's basically my thesis. You don't need to read it now. I've told you all, all the juicy bits. And that is what I've been spending the past three years of my life looking into. Okay, two final questions. Am I a doctor now? Can we call you Dr. Shaba? I think so. <laughs> so I've been announced now as Dr. Shaba. Congratulations to Dr. Loton, which does feel very cool, but apparently it's honorary until either the uh, amendments are made, so hopefully by this Christmas. But some people also say until you actually go through your graduation ceremony, but some people don't go to their graduation ceremonies. So short story, yes, technically you can, but also please don't because it's really wanky. It was real fun for like, a couple days, but um, I don't want like in 10 years time everyone being like, oh, Dr. Sharpa from the YouTube. Finally, what's next? Are you gonna actually use your PhD, Sharpa? Yes, I hope so. But also it doesn't matter if you don't, like a PhD doesn't have to be a stepping stone into an academic career. I think that's like a stigma that should not exist. But I guess in an odd way, I kind of am in an industry level. Uh, at the beginning of my PhD and before the pandemic hit, I was part of the All Party Parliamentary Group, a social media and young people where we were talking about social media and the regulations in parliament that can be made to protect it. And so hopefully when that's like properly up and running, I can still use these findings to contribute to some sort of social good. I'm also hoping that I can speak more to some actual social media companies, so like the powers that be, to help train creators on the responsibilities that they have and the viewers on how easy it is to be influenced because I think these findings are also really important for all of us to understand our places, you know, and how we can really benefit from social media whilst protecting against the harms that overconsumption of social media can provide. So yeah, I do still hope to be using it, but I'm not thinking about it right now. <laughs> Thoroughly enjoying creating. It's an accidental thing that Jamie and I sort of fell into um, and we're incredibly grateful that this is how we make our living now. So definitely creating, of course, but being a creator doesn't last forever. When I'm like 50 odd and inevitably still wanting to work because I don't think there'll be a time where I ever don't want to work, I'm definitely keeping the door open to go back into academia at that point. Maybe teaching at university. That's the plan, maybe, who knows? Being 50 is a very long time away. But for now, I'm very happy to put academia to one side. I'm very excited to create a little bit more, make more content that I'm super passionate about now that I have more time to do it after I've done these corrections, of course. And I really thank you for all of your support during this amazing and turbulent and wild and happy and sad and angry and frustrating times. There's nothing quite like doing a PhD, I don't think. I can't liken it to any other work experience. Underwhelming and overwhelming and satisfying and frustrating all at once. <laughs> but it feels nice to be contributing towards something bigger. You'll definitely be seeing me more around the internets now and certainly next week with another video, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Until then, maybe consider giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing if you'd like to, take a look at that little join button. Be kind and have a great day. See you later.